Well, thank you and uh, good afternoon. I noticed on the wall here, this calendar is August uh, 1991, which is actually when I came to the University of Missouri Rolla at the time. You know, I have been there on purpose for example. Yeah, yeah, it's just been waiting for me all this time. So I came in the room and sat down in the chair and looked at the calendar. I was like, whoa, this brings back some uh, some ancient memories. Um, but uh, thank you, appreciate the welcome. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, Wolf Creek and uh, you know, kind of where we've been, where we've gone, and uh, what the company that I work for, which is Evergy, uh, what it represents. A little bit about leadership, and then at the end, we'll talk a little bit about challenges to nuclear power. And uh, this is interactive, so if you have questions or you want to know more about a certain subject, dig in. All right, so I'm going to start with nuclear power in the United States, which this shouldn't come as any surprise to y'all. But uh, currently we have nuclear power generates about 50% of the nation's carbon-free electricity. And we have 54 generating sites with uh, 93 total reactors. So some units have three. There's uh, one unit, Vogel, which is currently building four reactors. The fourth one just had a uh, criticality where they just achieved criticality. So uh, they're about to put that unit online. That really represents the last unit that's being built in the United States right now, okay? 67 reactors generating greater than 900 megawatts hours. So these are big units, really big units. Our particular unit, as you'll see, is around 1,250 megawatts uh, that we generate for a single nuclear unit. And then uh, there's 19 generating sites with a single reactor. We happen to be one of those. So, what do you think if you're a uh, if you have multiple units on a site? What do you think? Is there a benefit to having multiple units on a site or having a single unit? So it's economy of scale, right? The more you have on your site, I mean, yes, you may need more people, but you can actually get a lower, you know, cost per person across the board. So typically, those generating sites that have three units can achieve better cost performance than a single nuclear unit site. But not always, but in many cases they can just from sheer, uh, you know, being able to benefit from that economics. So Wolf Creek, uh, we are Kansas's only nuclear generating station. So here's a picture from kind of back in the day it started in 1971, where two companies agreed, KG&E and Kansas City Power and Light, uh, agreed to uh, build a nuclear plant. 1977, we had a final construction permit, and then in 1981, KEPCO, which is a uh, Kansas Electric Power Cooperatives. So they're a co-op that serves almost the entirety of, uh, of Kansas, bought 6%. And then we eventually went commercial in 1985. Why do you think this was kind of delayed if you get your final construction permit here and you don't go live till 1985? What happened in between there? 1979 was Three Mile Island, okay? And when Three Mile Island happened, it created a number of licensing challenges to the license that had been issued, the construction permit, and it created a number of things that all of the sites that were still in construction had to go fulfill and do before they could go operational. So I kind of caught that when I worked at Arkansas Nuclear One, we had two units uh, at A and O. Uh, unit One went commercial in 1972, I believe, and uh, Unit Two didn't go commercial until like 1982. And they got caught into this the same thing. They were building almost at the same time period as Wolf Creek. They just happened to be a little bit further along and we're able to get through the wickets a little faster than Wolf Creek was at the time. But uh, Three Mile Island was definitely an impact to the nuclear industry in that you had to go back and do some redesign type efforts uh, to satisfy the regulator. So Wolf Creek by the numbers, we generate around 1200 megawatts. Realistically, it's about 1250 on average if you looked at across the board. Uh, and we are looking right now about doing a potential power upgrade, you know, and uh, not a big one. I mean, we're not trying to do something that's uh, 10 or 20%, but uh, measurement uncertainty, 
uh, get better at the uh, using ultrasonic flow meters to basically get another three to five percent. So that's something we're actively considering. We're located in Coffee County. We've been operational in 1985. We're currently licensed to 2045, and we are considering whether we should go in for a second license renewal. We'll probably make that decision around the 2030 time period. Right now, I mean, we've got a full 20 years in front of us. Uh, we're just about to enter the period of extended operation, which is 2025 through 2045. Uh, and the refueling outage that we're actually going to is kind of our last refueling outage before we enter that period of extended operation. So we've been working on this for about the last eight years to make sure all the testing, all the surveillances, all the requirements from a regulatory aspect are completed so that it's a clean entry into the period of extended operation. Go ahead. We've already went through its first license. Yeah, it was licensed for 40 years. And then we went for our first license renewal, got that from 2025 to 2045. And then uh, now we're contemplating the second license renewal. And many, uh, many plants are actually doing this right now in the United States. Uh, and whenever I get to the back and I talk a little bit about the challenges of nuclear power, particularly with the regulator, um, one of those will be as all the existing nuclear units put in you know, hey, we may want to do some power up rates. Hey, we want, may want to do second license renewal. That is going to conflict with small modular reactor licensing. So, and and it only goes through one place, right? And, and that's the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So uh, very easily that could uh, that could represent kind of a log jam for everybody. And we're in operating cycle twenty six, which means you know twenty six eighteen month cycles is uh, what, we've, what we're about to wrap up on and complete. And we're about to go into a refueling outage here in March. All right, so some other quick numbers, not gonna cover everything on this. We represent about 17% of the uh, total electricity generated in Kansas, just across the board. And then about 89 Kansas counties receive Wolf Creek Power. As I mentioned, 6% owner of Wolf Creek is the Kansas Electric Power Cooperatives. And they cover all of the vast counties in Kansas that aren't very populated. So, you know, our power goes a long way whenever there's, you know, 5,000 people in a total county, you know, out in uh, Western Kansas in particular. This one is always uh, a proud moment for me, 10 million safe work hours. Uh, we've achieved that a couple of times where we've been up to 10 million or plus 10 million plus safe work hours, which is a, Pretty amazing accomplishment when you consider it's an industrial uh, work atmosphere with all the various hazards, you know, falling, tripping, et cetera, uh, beyond just electricity and other hazards. Uh, we're right now around eight and a half million and uh, coming up out of the outage, we'll probably be close to 10 million again. We've had a run of about four years now without an OSHA recordable, which uh, is pretty noteworthy for even anybody in the industry. So far, we're like one of the top plants in safety record amongst our industry. And then uh, these two numbers, obviously nuclear plants are a big impactor in the local communities they serve. That's kind of a differentiator between us and maybe wind energy or solar energy, right? The investment in the community kind of comes when wind energy or solar energy builds that plant. Nuclear energy, it resides there and it continues to reside there through the payroll. So our impact through payroll and our impact through taxes are pretty vast for the communities we serve. And that's why the people in Coffee County would love us to build another unit. I mean, they'll, the mayor comes to my, uh, you know, any kind of meetings we have with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission or public meetings, and they're constantly like, hey, when are you gonna build another unit at Wolf Creek? And uh, when I was at Arkansas Nuclear One, that used to be my favorite time was the uh, NRC typically holds public meetings and it's not really for the licensee to talk at the public meetings. We will, if we need to, to, you know, to help the regulator or to, you know, make sure that we keep things, you know, accurate and, and factual. Um, but they used to be the question that they would ask the NRC every day, or we would have a public meeting. The mayor would get up from Russellville, Arkansas and say, why haven't you let these guys build a nuclear power station? Uh, another nuclear power station at Arkansas. 
which is a great feeling. I mean, that's true community support, right? They they want they know nuclear and they want more of it. So this uh, hopefully it'll work. I'm gonna kind of roll through the first couple of minutes and just give you a little discussion. Let's see. It does. Let me see. All right. Well, I'll skip the. I'll skip the tour part. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Oh, there we go. All right. Let's try it again. Welcome and thank you for joining us on a visual tour of Energy Wolf Creek Nuclear Generating Station. Wolf Creek is located 95 miles south of downtown Kansas City along I-35. In the heart of Coffee County, the site's location is nestled in between the cities of Neustron, Burlington, and Leroy. Built along the edge of what will eventually be Coffee County Lake, the plant's property spans over 10,500 acres. Just across the lake, approximately five miles, is the Dwight D. Eisenhower training facility. And finally, as we travel just seven miles north along I-75, you'll find our emergency response facility recently constructed to help with emergency responses in our region. Federal, state, and county, as well as Wolf Creek personnel, train together in this facility. Energy Wolf Creek facilities span nearly 16 miles across Coffin County, employing just over 800 employees. As we zoom in closer to the site, you'll find a Coffee County Lake daily surrounds the site property. Totally over 5,000 acres, the site serves as the plant's ultimate heat sink. All right, now that you have a better idea of where Wolf Creek is located and the facilities we have throughout the region, it's finally time to go on site and get a closer look. For those of you who have been here before, welcome back. But for those of you who haven't, we're excited for you to join us. And now, <laughs> welcome to Wolf Creek. Welcome. So I'll just uh, stop it there, and uh, you know we may play the other in the back part, but you know it's a it's a good introduction. We have a full communication staff at uh, at Evergy that works for our overall corporation that can put together videos and things like this. But we actually have two dedicated communications folks at our site full time because it truly is a small town, right? You know, eight hundred people is what normally is at our station. During an outage, that is going to be up to around 1,600 people. So it's a, it's you're the mayor of a small town. If you're the site vice president, one of the things you need to be doing is constantly communicating with your people, what you expect, what you desire, what you're looking for. You know where people didn't meet the standards, where they did meet the standards, celebrating, you know, great activities and and awesomeness that you see, and also, uh, you know, subtly coaching things that you don't want to see anymore. So uh, it's kind of a, a neat thing, but communications is one of the most critical pieces in nuclear power, really, to make sure that you have an organization that understands your culture and understands where you're trying to go and, and why. So critically important. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So I want to talk a little bit about Evergy's history. Evergy is new, uh, came along in 2020. Uh, so the Kansas City Power and Light and Westar, two companies that had been uh, there for a long time, I think uh, KCPNL was actually over 100 years old, merged in 2020, and that's what formed Evergy. And then Wolf Creek, uh, both of those companies, Kansas City Power and Light and and uh, Westar, own 47% each of Evergy or of Wolf Creek. So whenever those two companies merged, they became the 94% owner. So Therefore, we merged up with Evergy as opposed to being our own nuclear operating corporation. Uh, so that's kind of how, how that all evolved. But uh, great place to work. We serve about 1.7 million customers in Kansas and Missouri. This is kind of a quick map so you can kind of see, you know, the areas. You can also see if you had a more ability to get a little closer, you can see we've got generation facilities, we've got wind, solar. We've got some nuclear landfill, et cetera. So there's some different generation facilities that we use and uh, throughout the Evergy territory to satisfy uh, the needs of the folks. 
And then, like I said, the 6% owner is KEPCO, and they really service a lot of these counties and going further this way. They are truly the Kansas Electric Power Cooperative uh, group. And so it's a formation of all the various cooperatives or municipalities or so on in Kansas, which makes for a really interesting dynamic whenever you meet with their board of directors, because there's probably like 40 or 50 different entities there that uh, you get to discuss with. And the one thing I do know is they all love having a nuclear power station, which is pretty phenomenal when you consider all of those different interests. Uh, and that's because they've been able to see that we've been a great partner for them to provide low energy or low cost electricity over the years. So as I said, 1.7 million customers, that's kind of our 15,400 megawatts of own generation. Uh, we've got a number of renewables and you can see the miles of transmission because Kansas and Missouri are pretty big states, right? So there's uh, quite a bit of electric line out there. This is uh, kind of what I mentioned before about the energy mix. If you look here in 2005, you can see almost, you know, you had 38% natural gas and oil, you had 52% coal. So we were like dominated 90% by coal, fossil energy, right? And you can see over, you know, over the time, we've slowly but surely tried to transition more and more to letting wind energy fill a lot of that. Um, Western Kansas, if you've ever been out there, is just full of wind farms. If you drive over towards Colorado, I mean, wind farms for days as you're traveling through that area. And even just north of our nuclear power station, we have a about a 200 megawatt electric wind plant. You know, so they, they're pretty much all over in Kansas and they do brisk business. And I'll show you some more discussion about that as we as we go. But you can slow, see we're slowly but surely shrinking. Uh, Nuclear is not shrinking any. We're still generating or generating even more. But, you know, as you start creating more and more generation, right, our pie piece shrinks a little bit. Go ahead. Yes, this over here. Yeah, so this is uh, what I would call the, uh, let's just call it, we're cheating because we don't know what that's going to be in the future. Is it batteries? Is it small modular reactors? You know, new nuclear? That's what that really represents is enabling technology or, or electrical storage. Uh, there was just a plant in California that went online, a big solar plant, about 250 megawatts or four, no, it's 400 megawatts of solar, I believe. And it had, uh, something like 12,000 megawatt hours of capacity in batteries. So pretty big battery storage. But now everybody's wondering about how long is that gonna last, right? How long do your batteries stay good for? You know, that, that is an unanswered question out there. I mean, there's a lot of research been done, but nobody's really done it. So you kind of have to wait and see what the proof and the pudding is. But these are kind of our rough estimated of where we think we're going to go. Slowly but surely, we want to shrink coal. We'll probably keep gas because gas is great from a peaking aspect and generally cleaner than, uh, than coal. But we do want to shrink coal. And then this 19%, as I said, represents where new nuclear would fit in into the Evergy portfolio. As I discussed, Evergy is about a $15 billion market cap. And so we're probably not going to be one of the first movers when it comes to small modular reactors or that sort of thing. What we need to see is what's the price point. Uh, as these small modular reactors get built, you build a couple of them and all of a sudden you'll establish what is the economics of them versus the megawatts produced. That's what's going to determine smaller organizations like Evergy, 15 billion or Ameren, to make a decision on, yes, we want small modular reactors. So right now in our, in our uh, long-term plans and where we're looking in the future, that's why we call it enabling technology. You know, is that fusion? Is it small modular reactors? Is it battery technology? We don't know, but we wanna hold that open for one of those enabling technologies. One thing I will tell you is uh, we have kind of taken a, a slower pace in transition away from coal uh, than, uh, than many of our competitors. And uh, 
what we're starting to see is that that it's paying off for us. Because many people went and said, all right, we're done, turn the coal plants off. But then they didn't have adequate ability to generate whenever the market demands were out there. Uh, whereas we didn't have any problems. So if you saw the winter storm that happened this year, even though our coal plants were froze up a little bit and I, I feel kind of bad for our guys out there in the generation facilities, they were out there with literally with shovels and uh, pickaxes and uh, and sledgehammers and breaking apart the coal pile so that they could put it in there. Other than that, we were able to safely and successfully navigate that without issue. And of course the nuclear plant ran at 100% without issue all the way throughout the cold period. So one of the things that Winter Storm Uri happened a couple of years ago, we ran through that without any issue at all. That's really the benefit of nuclear power is it has a natural resilience to climate change issues and concerns. Not to say completely, right? We depend on water to cool our reactors. So if you have a, a climate induced drought or something like that, you could very well find yourself into trouble. But uh, Cold weather, that's not really that big of a deal. Hot weather even, not really that big of a deal for current nuclear power, power plant designs. So I wanna talk just a little bit about Wolf Creek. I'm, uh, I'm pretty proud about Wolf Creek. Uh, I've been there about 10 years now. Uh, before that, I was uh, 16 years with Arkansas Nuclear One, for, worked for Intergy. Uh, the only thing that I don't like about Evergy really is because I used to work for Intergy and then we knew, named the new company Evergy and I have a really hard time saying that uh, back and forth. Um, that's about my only gripe about the whole situation. Um, but I've really enjoyed my time at Wolf Creek. I can tell you when when I came to Wolf Creek, we weren't performing great. It wasn't a great culture. We weren't performing well. Um, great people, but they needed a lot of leadership. They needed a culture change, and they needed to be able to believe that they could perform at a high level. And so over the last 10 years, that's what we've been working on uh, between uh, Adam Heflin, Cleve Reasoner, and myself, uh, and many others who work, work for us and with us, uh, we've been able to successfully move the station in a positive direction. Realistically, same people who were there when our performance wasn't so good, are the same performance, the same people who are there now who are performing at an excellent level and have performed excellently for about the last six, seven years. So sometimes it just takes leadership and uh, change of a culture and getting people to believe that uh, they can perform at a high level. So we always start at Wolf Creek with people are our most valuable resource. They truly are. Uh, if you look at nuclear power, sure, there's a lot of procedures, sure, there's a lot of regulation, sure, there's all sorts of interesting things about the technology. It is pretty unique and special, and you got to respect all that, but it's ultimately the people. The people are the difference maker. We generally attract rules-minded folks with a high work ethic, and especially at Wolf Creek, the work ethic is typically off the charts. One of the ways that we do our business of, uh, I'll say indoctrination or making the culture real is when people come in, you know, we'll give them the Wolf Creek way. It's a little manual, talks about leadership, talks about how we do our business, why we do what we do. Pretty simple type stuff. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not rocket science or anything. It's not overly complex but it just gets people grounded and they understand what we're here for and what we what we believe in as a leadership team. And one of the things we believe in is people need to be nuclear professionals. If you step on our site and you get a badge and you work at Wolf Creek or any other nuclear power station for that matter, but especially at Wolf Creek, we expect you to behave as a nuclear professional. And those are what we call being professional to the core. So we always tie things back to the core, the health and safety of the public, how we're protecting the health and safety of the public, how we're protecting the reactor core. And it may be protecting the reactor core from ourselves. What are we doing? And do we know that we're doing the right thing and that we're doing the right thing to make sure that the core is protected at all times? 
What's that? Yeah, practice star. So star is self-checking. Stop, think, act, and review. So anytime you go out to the field and you're about to do an activity, you stop. Think about what the response is you are going to get out of this. And one of the things we ask our people is, when you're thinking, if you're not 100% sure of what's going to happen when you're about to do this activity, just stop. Stop and get the team involved. Because one of the things we found in nuclear power, uh, in many cases, and even when Wolf Creek wasn't performing quite as well as it is now, is people would be like, I'm pretty sure I know. Pretty sure it's a terrible place to be in nuclear power. I'm pretty sure that's the way this works. And then you hit the switch and oh. that's not how it worked. So one of the things we had to overcome was using STAR, that stop, think, act, and review, is to give people the permission. It's okay. I know you got a great work ethic and I know you want to get that done. And I know that makes you feel good in getting the task or activity done. But you cannot do it unless you know for sure what you're about to do and understand what's going to happen when you do it. And that was an important step in building our culture where it's okay to stop. It's okay to stop. There's, there's no harm, no foul. I'd rather you stop and make sure, get the team involved, than I would you to proceed in the face of uncertainty. Kind of goes back to nuclear safety, but it also, uh, one of the things we've been working on over the last couple of years is our employees got that. You know, we have 800 employees at Wolf Creek. So our employees grasp that pretty quickly. The contractor workforce who comes to your station, they get to see, you know, everybody else and how they how they deal with it. So over time, we've slowly but surely convinced our contractor workforce, no, we really mean that. I, I really, I'm willing to pay you, even if you don't do that activity, as long as you stop and get the rest of the team involved before you proceed in the face of uncertainty. I would rather you be sure than you just go do it. And that took a while for moving our contractors to that culture. But imagine how powerful it is now when contractors will come to you and during a refueling outage, we'll have 800 people that work at the plant and we'll have another 800 people that join us for the refueling outage. Those 800 folks are contractors. They get trained by the industry, not necessarily by Wolf Creek. And so you have a limited time of ability to influence them whenever they come to your station. And if you can get them to trust you enough to be like, hey, I'm not going to touch that unless I absolutely know, then you can win the game. Because a lot of times you won't find those errors or issues until later when the problem manifests. So important piece of establishing a culture, of leadership, communication, and constantly coming back to these as touchstone things. So we just, uh, for example, this professional decor or Tenants of a Nuclear Professional. We just celebrated that again in October of, of last year. We did a big expo. We had the whole station out, fed everybody barbecue. There were like 40 booths that people went through on each one of those bullets up there. And our people taught each other what it means to be a nuclear professional. Pretty cool. One of the things in nuclear power you'll see is uh, a huge push on is sustainability. If you look at the current uh, nuclear power stations, when I told you before, there's, you know, 53 of us out there, uh, 53 generating facilities, you know, out in the industry right now, we're at the highest level of performance we've ever been at. Okay. So not in the 90s, not in the 2000s, not in the 2010s, in the 2020s, highest level performance the nuclear industry has ever been at in the United States. I mean, just absolutely crushing it for the most part at all of our reactors. Where we're going now is how do we bake that in so it's sustainable, that it continues, that you generate this culture of continuous improvement where you, you want to get better and better day after day and keep working that equation. And so that's one of the many things that we're working on at our station. I mean, we've been performing very well for at least the last five, six, seven years. How do we now create that to where it's a decade or two decades where people come in and they have a full career and the only thing they know is excellent operations? That's what we're after. 
So we got the refueling 26 coming up. As I said, that's a true proof in the pudding moment. So you can talk all the talk, but you really get to walk the walk whenever you're in refueling outage because uh, you got 40, 42 days is what our uh, schedule is going to be for our refueling outage. And it's, uh, it's going to be a challenge. I got a couple of videos. I'll see if these work. So you may or may not have seen this before, but this is uh, the reactor lifting of the reactor vessel head and moving it over to the stand. Now, obviously, that's a lot faster, you know, than we actually do it. Uh, sped up quite a bit. Yeah. Well, no, in this case, the the fuel is still down here. So you got to take the reactor vessel head off, and then you'll flood up. So you'll see here in a minute. So that's the reactor vessel head coming off. Yep. And here's kind of a refueling. So after you take the reactor vessel head up, you're able to flood all the water into the refueling canal, uh, 23 feet plus, and then uh, grab an assembly out of the reactor core, take it over to the transfer station. You know, it goes into the up ender, the up ender goes down, goes through a tube, over to our spin fuel pool, upends it back up, and then we put it into the spin fuel pool. Let me see here. I was going to try and freeze it on that. Let's see if I can go back one. <laughs> As uh, when I started my career, I came out of uh, out of here. And I got a job at Arkansas Nuclear One as a reactor engineer. I was a reactor engineering uh, guy for three or four years. And uh, I did quite a bit of this same thing, riding the bridge, taking the fuel out, you know, taking the fuel over the spent fuel pool, taking a camera and reading all the serial numbers, looking for uh, fuel failures, uh, taking fuel assemblies apart where you uh, had vendors in, and they would help you take the fuel assemblies apart because you may have had a fuel failure or something like that. And you had to go find the the rod that was failed. And it's always exciting. Go ahead. <laughs> Why is it blue? It's really just uh, kind of the depth of water and the lights we use. Yeah. I think we just like the blue because you know, once you look down in the core, you get to see the shrink off radiation. So, you know, we like to keep it kind of the same kind of theme. So the one thing I was going to show is, you know, so to start a refueling off, you know, you shut the reactor down and everything. You take the reactor head off and you put it up here and then you have this, which is called your upper internals which sits on top of the fuel, and that's where control components, that sort of thing goes down through the reactor vessel head. So you gotta take that off, set that someplace, which happens to be right there. So important, couple of important cycles of lifts and heavy ones too. I mean, the reactor vessel head is a lot of weight, right? So it, it, that is uh, what we call an infrequently performed test, and ev test or evolution, because it's, I won't say it's high risk, but I mean, you're lifting a tremendous amount of weight and everything needs to be perfect. Uh, you're also suspending a huge amount of dose in the air. I mean, that is directly, you know, the bottom part of it is obviously directly in line with your actual coolant system. So as you pull that up and move it over there, the dose is pretty high. You want to make sure you control it in all ways. So this is, as I was saying, where you're removing the upper internals. The one we won't show you on this is you also have to pull occasionally your core barrel. So the core barrel is actually what your fuel resides in during normal operation, right? So occasionally you have to pull the core barrel for uh, ISI inspections, or uh, right now there's OE out in the industry where there's been some cracking of core barrel welds and that sort of thing in other plants. Robinson in particular has had a recent issue with that. 
And the nuclear industry, I mean, we survive on operating experience, right? If one plant has it, uh, we'll go to the PWR owners group or we'll go to uh, NEI or the EPRI and they will do the research on that from a metallurgical aspect and then come back and say, you know, sorry, you need to pull your core barrel and uh, take a look at that, to see if you're susceptible. Yeah, the core barrel. Absolutely. So right here is the core is the pulling of the core barrel. So yeah, you got to take all the fuel out, and then you got to pull the entire core barrel. And at that point, you can see all the way to the bottom of the reactor vessel, right? Um, nothing in between you and all the way to the bottom. So also a great time to you know if there is anything in there, it's a great time to vacuum things up and find it and grab stuff. Which, you know, as you can imagine, you know, you might have like, uh, you know, we, we treat foreign material extremely cautiously, right? And we don't let hardly anything get in there. But occasionally you do see things that the reactor coolant pumps have chopped up and it ends up usually in the bottom of that, the bowl of the reactor vessel. Uh, well, not at Wolf Creek, but uh, at, uh, I think it was Callaway, found like a hard hat. Somebody had dropped a hard hat, probably from construction. And, uh, you know, these reactor coolant pumps are huge pumps, right, with massive impellers. And they just chawed that thing to pieces. And then you went down there and you'd be like, what is that? You start looking at it and you're like, ah, oh, it's a hard hat. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Uh, in the bottom, yeah, but they had yep. We've actually seen that at ours. We had uh, they're like spiral wound gaskets, and uh, those spiral wound gaskets. Uh, you know, this is a kind of a problem about ten years ago, but they can kind of come loose, and and most of the time they're not going to come loose and get in your system. But every once in a while they got loose and went down the pipe, and then as soon as they got to a pump, right, chop, 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 just chops it right up and sends it wherever it's going to be. So, I mean, from a foreign material aspect, that's something we look really hard about because we don't we don't want to have any fuel failures in our reactors. All right, so I'm going to talk just briefly about this. So, you know, I talked about our drive to excellence and uh, how we were able to, to do that at Wolf Creek. Well, at the same time, we've also been cutting cost and getting more economical. And we we did this with forethought and discussions with our people. We said, listen, you know, we're going to challenge you to do this with less staff than what you may have had in the past. Um, and, you know, of course, that was was like, OK, well, what are you talking about? And it's like this is all about being economical. The thing that shuts nuclear plants down usually isn't a big issue occasionally. I mean, Crystal River is an example and Songs is an example of two nuclear units that got shut down because of big engineering type issues. One was delamination of the reactor or uh, of the containment structure. One was an issue with their steam generators. Okay, big engineering or technical issues, I would say. Most of the nuclear power stations that have shut down over the last 15 years have been purely economics, purely economics. And so one of the driving forces we had was, listen, we weren't performing very well and we cost quite a bit of money to operate, that's not a great recipe if we want to operate our plant to 2045 and even to 2065. So we wanted to get to be one of the top performing stations in the United States, and we wanted to be one of the low cost performers in the United States. And that's where we're currently at. And that's that took a journey. So uh, not gonna go over this quite a bit, but I mean, we've been looking at doing a 5% reduction from about 2020 to 2024. Uh, and slowly but surely, we've used staffing reductions. We haven't laid anybody off. That's not one of the tenants that we hold. We don't believe in layoffs and that sort of thing. We did it with attrition. So if we saw where a retirement was coming up, maybe we didn't refill that position. We tried to be very smart and look at benchmarking about where we wanted to go where we were probably a little bit heavy in staffing and where it was okay to trim up on. We're also been using labor capitalization. So really looking at 
what our labor costs should be charged to capital, which doesn't count against your O and M type budgets. And then looking at overall pension cost reduction. This one we didn't really go after very much, but it kind of worked itself out because as the generation of folks who were on pension has slowly but surely retired, there's less and less folks with pensions currently. And it's more of 401ks, super 401ks, that sort of thing, which are more portable investment options for the uh, people who are coming on now. So this blue line kind of represents, you can kind of see where we're at. Um, we're chasing the second and first plants in our cost category and slowly but surely driving to catch them. So there's kind of a base operating cost data. When I joined Wolf Creek, uh, we would have been over here. And uh, through the hard work of our people, we've been able to slowly but surely move over to right here, which puts us like the third plant. There's 12 up there. These are all single nuclear unit sites that we're comparing against that are greater than 800 megawatts. So truly a comparison of our industry peers out there. And uh, slowly but surely, we've been moving in the right direction. It's uh, there is some challenge because you'll what you'll see is Wolf Creek. We're not a fleet; we're a single nuclear unit operator. We don't have a fleet supporting us. And what we're competing against now is a couple of plants that have fleets. And so, what do a fleet do for you? Well, you get economy of scale, right? You can have a fleet headquarters where that's where your whole engineering group relies, and they serve us. If you got five plants, they service five plants from the fleet as opposed to having those resources at each individual station. So this is a real challenge to slowly but surely get close to these guys at the fleet. But we're we're digging, we're getting there. The key is to not go too fast. That's that's my real feedback. You can uh, you can always say I'm going to make changes and we're going to really move the needle. But if you go too fast or faster than your organization can handle. That's usually how you end yourself up in a train wreck in a bad situation. So sometimes you have to pump the brakes and be a little patient as you're slowly but surely moving the organization in the right direction. But a lot of this was showing our organization the score, making sure they knew what was potentially in front of us if we didn't change our behaviors and our performance, both you know, pursuing excellence and performance, but also making sure that you understood what you're doing with cost. And, you know, I'm a firm believer if you put the score up in front of people and they know what the score is and they believe it's accurate and true, then they will self-motivate to try and do better. They will, they will try and find the way to do better and they will exceed what you expect. Sure. Yep, different nuclear generating station, single nuclear unit sites. Yeah, yeah. I don't necessarily have permission to to share all the names. I could probably tell you exactly what their names are um, pretty quickly because I know our competitors and where we're at. You know, and this is our change over the last five years. You can see we've been on a pretty good downward turn for staffing. You know, and this, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of challenge in doing this and doing it right. Um, you know, because you can get into all sorts of things where people just get paralyzed because, well, I just don't have the staff that I once did. So you got to empower them. We've got a full innovation group that works out at, at Wolf Creek. We're constantly looking for innovative ideas. Uh, we bought a robot dog uh, called Chief that we used. Our, our radiation protection folks are working on using that inside high uh, radiation areas. So send the dog in there instead of a human. Dog doesn't get dosed, right? Well, he does, but his dose doesn't count uh, like a human's does. So, uh, and we've got all sorts of activities like that that we're doing. We're looking at using artificial intelligence. So trying to make it where our people aren't doing the work that was, uh, that could be done by the computer, that could be done by artificial intelligence, could be done by something else, and let them do the real work of thinking, being engaged, making decisions, taking that and moving it forward, creating ideas, creating value for the company.
So again, you know, where are we at? Or, you know, where were we at uh, 10, 11 years ago? Uh, when we first came in, we were fourth quartile in performance. I mean, if you looked at almost any metrics or any performance across the board, we were fourth quartile. Uh, it was a little bit dire at Wolf Creek, and we were definitely fourth quartile in cost performance. Um, and now we're one of the top quartile plants in the industry in performance. Uh, INPO, the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations, looks at each plant every two years and gives you a rating. Uh, and we've been exemplary over the last three times that they've done it. So 2019, 21, and 2023. And now we're seeking our fourth. Because, you know, I tell our folks what's better than three info ones is four info ones. So we're we're hungry for that. How do we build this decades of performance? Uh, we had an international uh, OSART team uh, come in and uh, give us a review. So that was uh, interna uh, International Atomic Energy Agency. They only do that to nuclear plants in the United States about once every four years. So we were honored to be chosen for that, have them come in and give us a good scrub. Um, they really, they found like one recommendation in maintenance that we needed to work on, which I thought was pretty good effort from our, our folks. And then, you know, we are frequently benchmarked for leadership and positive teamwork. So I wanna talk just a little bit about uh, challenges and opportunities for nuclear. And uh, be open to any questions. So I'll start with uh, spent fuel storage and disposal. Um, Wolf Creek went critical in 1985. We were like one of the last plants to build an ISFACY. When I was at Arkansas, I probably loaded 30 casks myself uh, for dry fuel storage. I came to Wolf Creek uh, 10 years ago, and we hadn't even started with a with an ISFACY program. Um, partly because we didn't need to. We had we had a huge uh, spin fuel pool and, and we were still working through the use of it. So we really didn't need to go there yet. But uh, the big issue with spent fuel storage and disposal is not so much the storage aspects. Technically, that's not really an issue. I mean, we can store for 100 years, we could store for 250 years if we really wanted to, not an issue. The real issue is about disposal and what's gonna happen eventually with disposal. So uh, I'll tell you, the United States government has a contract with every nuclear plant in existence in the United States. And that was supposed to happen in uh, 1988 was when everybody entered the contract with the uh, federal government and we all started paying into this fund. And then in 1998, they were supposed to start picking up our fuel. Anybody wanna hazard a guess as to how much fuel has been picked up so far? Yeah, so, you know, and is this a technical problem? I say, no, it's not a technical problem. This is a political problem, you know, and, and we're gonna have to just keep working through it from a United States aspect and figure out, figure this one out. So we have built our own ISFACY. You can see it, you know, kind of up there. We have like a wine rack design where, you know, you can load it at the bottom, you can load it kind of up to the top. And uh, we're the first one to build that wine rack design uh, licensed it through Framatone or Arano, but <clears throat> well, um, the way it works is we pay for it, and then we get reimbursed by the DOE from the fund, and you basically get reimbursed about ninety-four percent of the amount of money you invest, roughly. I mean, if you really look at the the ins and outs of it, you get about ninety-four percent back. So it's a capital investment. We invest capital in it, build the structure, and then through the uh, through the Department of Energy, we get about 94% back. And that's kind of a settlement deal that we've worked with the Department of Energy to get that level. When I worked for Intergy, uh, one of the things I got to do was go and testify in federal court multiple times because we basically, Intergy sued the federal government for breach of contract. And uh, we were able to get you know, pretty good amount of money back. But again, as a similar type case, we had to build it because, you know, no nothing was happening. Nobody had moved any fuel. The federal government hadn't came and, and gotten the fuel. And then we basically had to sue the government to get our money back, which I thought was pretty disappointing when, you know, you're like, there's billions of dollars that we've paid into this fund. And we're essentially having to, you know, here we keep paying, but please give us our own money back. You know, it's just, 
it wasn't very palatable. I was a young nuclear engineer at the time, so I, I probably had it more idealistic. But uh, it was just one of those where I was like, this is this is not the way the business should be ran. But anyway. How much is base there right now? Or how much is supposed to be? Or how much are you guys planning to build? Let's say, how long will this last before we actually really make that initiative? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I would love to see us enter into some reprocessing or something like that. Uh, right now, it's just that, you know, why haven't, why is not the United States reprocessed? Well, one, the federal government really haven't, you know, mandated it or created a strategy that favors it. That's, that's one. Yeah, they, they created a law. Now the law is kind of gone. But, you know, there's a lot of uh, not very much faith that you could go down that path. And the other part is, it's just, uh, it's a more expensive option right now. I can go mine it out of the ground you know, get the enrichment and everything as opposed to going to reprocessing. However, comma, as rarity goes up, you know, down the road, people are going to start looking at these isphases as like, there's a lot of energy there, right? When we run our reactor for, for you know, four and a half years with the fuel in it before we discharge it, um, you know, there's 90 to 92 percent of the power still in that, in that uh, you know, uranium. It just needs to be gotten out and reprocessed. Yeah, well, this is kind of a funny story. So whenever we built our first ISFCE, we only built with eight locations for putting, you know, eight holes. And it takes 37 assemblies in each one of those holes for the containers. Why did we do that? I mean, we could have built one that was huge pad, right, and did it. But the Department of Energy is like, listen, you know, if you build more, than what you reasonably need over the next four to five year period, yeah, then uh, we're not going to give you, we're not going to allow you to claim that in the settlement. So economy of scale would be, Jamie, let's go build 70 locations all at once, right? Economy of scale would be huge for me, build them all at once. But the Department of Energy is like, oh no, don't do that because we might start taking your fuel. I, I Oh no, no, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's it's a little bit of a funny story, but it's true, and that's that's kind of the way the federal government has been looking at this is about a four to five win year window, which is not what you need to do for dry fuel, right? Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope. I, I personally, I think um, the best aspect of interim storage might be privatization, allowing the private companies. Like I know Holtec is like super interested in basically creating a facility down in New Mexico or Texas. I mean, there's one in in Texas and there's one in New Mexico that are kind of competing. My personal take is those private companies have much more higher chance than the federal government of succeeding. I, I agree. I agree. They want to, but you know, what results are you going to get? Those two private companies already have facilities that are ready to, I mean, within the next three years, they're going to be ready to take fuel. So, yeah, that's the hard part, right? We've, uh, I, I can tell you, Holtec and other companies have been to us very frequently because they're like, to ship from where can you are in Kansas to down in Texas or down in uh, New Mexico is like one of the shortest ways, right? Like they're looking at South Texas project plant, Comanche Peak, and then us, because we're like one of the closest plants and minimum number of states that you have to kind of go through. Um, so, and I think once one or two people do it, then the floodgates are gonna kind of open a little bit. So, this is a big challenge for the nuclear industry, particularly, you know, small modular reactors coming along, what are they going to do, right? It also affects your decommissioning cost. I mean, you know, decommissioning, it is all planned to go greenfield. Uh, there's been plants who have been decommissioned, but yet the one thing that's still on their station is an ISPACY that has to be guarded with security personnel and, and which represents cost, right? unanticipated costs that you have to basically continue until the DOE performs. So it's a challenge. 
And like I said, I don't believe it's a technical challenge. I mean, there's plenty of um, evidence out there in the world where you can have a, de you know, a depository or you can go through a reprocessing scheme. The one challenge for us that we have at Wolf Creek is, uh, I told you we're in the land of wind, right, with Kansas. So wind energy is high. So we see sometimes where it's negative pricing, okay? And uh, that's, that's kind of uh, impactful. And we didn't really see that about three or four years, or about I guess, five years ago. We really didn't see much negative pricing, but now negative pricing is getting more and more, particularly in certain parts of the year, you know, usually in the spring. Spring, the wind blows in Kansas a lot, okay? And to the point where in the Southwest Power Pool, which stretches from, you know, north of Texas all the way up to Minnesota is the length and breadth of the Southwest Power Pool. There's times when you can see 85 to 90% of the total energy in the Southwest Power Pool is wind. Think about that. That is a huge amount of energy. I mean, we're talking 50, I think it was 50 gigawatts of total. If you look at throughout that entire Southwest Power Pool, tremendous amount of wind energy can be generated. And when that happens, you get two things. You get high wind energy saturation in the in the power pool, and ours is particularly affected because we have mostly, you know, the Great Plains, and the Great Plains are highly dominated by wind energy. And the other part is, is you're just generating so much electricity, you have power congestion. You just can't feed it through the lines. You know, these. What's that? We we actually do. We're not load following per se. But in market conditions, we'll reduce power. So we'll go from 100% to 70% power and stay at 70% until market conditions basically say we should come back up. And we started doing that about four years ago. Before, oh no, we were 100% all the time, would never come off 100%. But uh, we saw the reality of, I mean, when your power is selling for negative $1.38 per megawatt, you're not making no money if you're online. And so creating less power is a benefit to the com company and it's a benefit to our customers, right? So in some cases, you know, you have to, you have to start thinking more radically or more innovative on how you're gonna tackle these things. So one of the things we're doing actually at our nuclear power station, the Southwest Power Pool looked at our unit and a lot of the wind from Western Kansas comes right to our switch yard. And then of course we add our 1250 megawatts on it and it just, creates this big lump of electricity that has to start traveling out through the lines. So the Southwest Power Pool is looking about putting another huge power line in, one of our 345 kV power lines from our plant going down to Springfield, Missouri, essentially. We call it the Blackberry line. So that's about to go in. We're interested because when we've seen another line go in in other locations, a lot of this negative pricing clears up instantly because now the power can flow again. But wind energy, when it really starts getting after it, I mean, you can see all of the costs in the entire area. The so you know, the uh, wind and solar, not too bad affected. Coal plants, gas plants, everybody is you know just getting hit by negative pricing at the time. That is something we're looking at. I mean, with that, we may need to do less flex or less going down to 70%. I mean, it got passed in Congress, but it really hasn't fully rolled out of, uh, you know, kind of the committees as to define who gets it and when do you get it and all that. So we're kind of still waiting. Uh, we've got a number of lawyers and tax experts just ready. <laughs> we're ready to go, but uh, we'll see. Well, I mean, essentially, you kind of have to pay somebody to take your megawatts. So you don't, you know, during that time period, you don't want to generate too many megawatts if you can. You know. Yeah, the reason, yeah, I mean, uh, you could go down further. 70% is a good stable power regime for us. Uh, you know, we look at, we don't want to go to, you know, 35% is a terrible place for most nuclear power stations. It's where you're you're coming off of startup or low load main feed reg valves or two main feed reg valves. 
And so it's just a bad place of instability. So we wanted to avoid that 70%. You don't take any of your major equipment off. You can just hang out at 70% generally indefinitely without any issue. One of the things we've been doing a lot of research on and studies is we've been going up and down now for about three and a half, four years. That's enough to give us evidence as to have we caused some kind of damage mechanism or caused some kind of issue on our components. Yeah, you know, damaging your feed water heaters because maybe they're getting a higher degree of flow than what they would at 100%, right? The whole plan is tuned. Every nuclear power station is tuned at 100% precisely, right? I mean, we have people crawling over the plant. We tune it to a, to a, a Nats eyelash of performance. But then when you get off of that from 70%, it is not tuned very well at, at different power levels. So that's what you worry is equipment reliability wise. So this is a challenge kind of more for us, like Ameren uh, and Callaway Nuclear Power Station here in Missouri, up in, uh, you know, just north of here, right? They don't really have this issue because wind energy isn't infiltrating their market as much. They're starting to see it more and more because wind energy is starting to become more prevalent in the uh, upper regions of uh, MISO where they're at, where the power group that they're in, but uh, slowly but surely they're starting to become aware of it, but they're not seeing it to the level we are. So kind of depends on where you live and where you operate. So then the last is uh, new nuclear, the challenge there. So, you know, as I said before, is Evergy interested in new nuclear? The answer is yes, we are, but, uh, you know, when we're not going to be like one of the first adopters of that uh, is a $15 billion market cap. It's just one of those things that you could sink your company if you jump in too early and you're wrong or the technology isn't the right fit for you or you don't get the economics out of it that you expected. So what I see companies like Ameren, Evergy, kind of smaller mid cap electric utilities, I see them kind of waiting for the bigger utilities to jump in and see where this thing goes. So TVAs, the Dukes out there, uh, Southern Power, uh, the Canadians are jumping in pretty heavily with small modular reactors. I think once you see that price point get established for this kind of uh, reactor and this amount of megawatts is this kind of cost point, I think that's where you'll see groups like Evergy and Ameren, those sort of plants jump in to uh, the small modular reactor game. So what is it? It represents a deal, real deal uh, challenge right now, even with our regulator. Um, our regulator, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is our primary regulator, regulator, a good set of regulators. So I'll, I'll just start with that. They're effective as a regulator. They are not necessarily efficient as a regulator. Okay, so there's difference, different discussion there. And uh, what we're seeing in particular, the challenge is they have staffing problems right now. Uh, they're trying to staff back up and uh, they're having a tremendous amount of retirements in their organization and having to retrain people uh, pretty frequently. And to the point where uh, we just we just saw a study. Um, I forget which plant it was, but they had put in for a second license renewal. And uh, they had put in a second license renewal and the actual amount of cost and the time it took for the NRC to review that second license renewal application, second license renewal was greater than what it took for the original plant licensing application when the plant was first put, in to the, put into the ground. I want you to think about that for a second. You know, and it was not, it wasn't like a little bit, it was almost double, okay? That is a big issue for all of the nuclear plants. And it's a big issue for small modular reactors coming through because the log jam that everybody's gonna reach is the NRC, right? All of this has got to go through them. If you're doing a power upgrade, if you're doing a second license renewal for existing nuclear plants, if you're a new, new application for a license, it's all got to go through. And they don't have more resources. They're trying to staff up to, you know, a little bit more but not staff up to what it was kind of in the 2010s when they thought there was gonna be a nuclear renaissance. So uh, they kind of learned their lesson back in the 2010s, staffed up and then it didn't materialize. So this time they're taking it slow. And that means 
that's really going to pump the brakes for small modular and it's going to pump the brakes for existing nuclear to some degree. So that's a challenge. Uh, the other challenge for for all the existing nuclear is the workforce impacts. You know, you have all of these small modular reactors have to go create licensing documents. So that's one resource they got to go grab up. They got to create training documents. They got to go get operators who can operate the reactors and train the next generation of these small modular reactors. All of those folks generally come either are contractors or they come from existing nuclear units. So that represents a challenge to us as the existing operators. So one of the things we're actually looking at is, you know, should we increase our staffing by, you know, let's say 10 headcount uh, because we want to be ready for that. When people leave, we don't want to be like, well, we're bare bone staff. You know, let's go ahead and contemplate that, you know, people may leave and uh, go to the small modular reactor type business. So again, like I said, where does it fit in long-term plans? I think it depends on what size cap company you are and uh, where things are at. Uh, and it'll also depend on the economics of the situation of small modular reactors. And that cost point is gonna be critically important. You know, you gotta, you gotta convince people, I don't need to build another solar plant or I don't need to build another uh, natural gas plant. You gotta convince them that nuclear is the right, right answer and here's the reasons why. And a lot of that starts with economy. So open it up to any questions.